Good morning. Good morning. With the same beauty as the songs we've heard, would you greet each other with that beautiful good morning? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> there are any announcements today? I want you to rise as you're comfortable to do so and join me in our call to worship. Come, God goes before us and opens wide the welcoming gates. God breaks our doors with wrong and the guard with iron. I'm sorry. Come, we are called by name. Oh, did I, I didn't miss one? Sorry. <laughs> Come receive the treasures and riches and laughter God offers. <laughs> Come, you who know God and who do not know God, God welcomes you. Welcome. Join me in our opening hymn. steadfast hope and giving and powerful giving help us hear your words challenging us to give you all the things that are yours help us remember that all we are and all we have are gifts from you gifts to be shared in service and love holy one among us help us be a holy people who receive your word with joy and live out your message with love Come this morning, God, and be among us. Amen. Amen. 
to celebrate with each other, to mourn with each other. Is there anything that you would like to share, to pray about together? And he taught us this prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, and deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> we come to that time where we remember what belongs to God. And we give to God a portion of our lives, represented as time, as prayers, as talents for each other as money. So I ask if you will rise as you are comfortable to do so and join me in dedicating these gifts to God. Thank you. The song is on 118. It's on what? 118. 118. <laughs>
Thank you. you. may be seated. Both of our readings are on the back of your bulletin. And the first is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. This letter was written to the church in Thessaly, which scholars believe was only a few months old. And Paul probably left so that they would stop getting so much attention and trouble because of him being there. But Paul writes back. From Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope and our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Acadia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Acadia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Our next reading is Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Matthew sets up one more test of Jesus' authority. Now, we have read the other ones in our previous weeks. Jesus is still teaching in the temple, and now the Pharisees and the Herodians come to him. Normally, these two groups of people hate each other, but nothing pulls enemies together like a common foe, and Jesus is their common foe. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for tax. And they brought him a Daenerys. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh God, let us give to you what belongs to you. Let our hearts and minds and souls reflect upon your holy wisdom. Amen. Divine providence, manifest destiny. These are words that we used to say all the time, and we don't use them very much anymore. Providence is to provide. So divine providence is God providing something. Destiny, what happens. Manifest destiny, the future which must happen, happening now. So when our four parents came here and they, they began to speak about God's providence, God had provided a brand new land to Christians. And we moved in and we settled. And we sang lots of hymns of manifest destiny and wrote home and said, come and experience God's future here. 
It's why we have so many churches called Zion or New Zion. Because America is said to be the light on the hill. The place where you come and know God's reign. Thomas Paine, someone who influenced so much of our culture, he wrote, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. A situation similar to the present hath not happened since the days of Noah until now. The birthday of the new world is at hand. Thomas Jefferson read Thomas Paine all the time. And Jefferson incorporated this language and said, democracy is blessed by God. We carried this forward. Our ancestors carried it forward. Our, virtuous, our virtuousness is being rewarded. And our mission now is to spread Christianity as far as we could. And our destiny was to live in God's reign here on earth. So we did it. You know, we went everywhere and we built roads and railways. We called progress inevitable, something that must happen. There's no turning back. It's destiny. We built great institutions. We designed how to run states and our whole nation. We proclaimed ourselves as that light. And yet, here we are this year struggling, feeling like this is not heaven on earth. Something is still missing. For all of that work, for all of that vision, for all of that providence, it's still not perfect. And I know you can feel that tension. We know that tension existed in our past, too. We know that the land was empty because all who had lived on it had largely died of smallpox. And when we found it wasn't empty, we gathered up those native tribes and put them on reservations. We know that we were able to clear so much land and feed so many people, in part because we enslaved so many people to work. We knew God's blessing. We said God was blessing us to do this. And now here we are in 2020, looking back at our past and wondering, was it a blessing? Were we blessed? Some people plug their ears because they don't want to hear any sort of negativity about our country. It's not the story we grew up with. Absolutely not. It's not a story we like. It challenges who we understand ourselves to be. Who are we if we are not God's chosen people? Who are we if we are not the best country on the face of the earth? Who are we if the narrative that we have learned our whole lives is incorrect, is threatened? Who are we? It's an honest question. Question. I might be wholly wrong, but I feel like that is why we are clinging to this election. This is the question. We're so invested because we want to know who are we. You've heard that this is an election for the spirit of America. And yeah, in a way it is. Because we are talking and reflecting about who we are and who we want to be. And whenever anybody questions their identity, whether it's an individual or a whole country, we become teenagers again. We become anxious and angry. We look for simplistic answers. We reach to the past and we wish things were as simple as we remember them to be. It's a question we're asking, and it's us growing up, changing. You've all told me many times that growing old is not for the weak or faint-hearted. I think growing older in general is not for the weak or faint-hearted. I was not old in my teens, but wow, it was hard. It was a lot harder than being nine. 
all of those emotions, all of that deciding who you are. And then I reached my 20s, and you know what? It was hard because now I have to learn how to be independent, learn how to balance a checkbook. I'm in my 30s. I'm learning how to parent. It's hard. <laughs> Growing older is not for the faint-hearted because things change. We look back and we see ways we, we made mistakes. And we look back and we say, here are ways I did awesome. And that's what I feel like our country is doing. We're having this moment where we are reaching the new stage of who we are. And we're taking stock, having this, this time to say, we are complicated. We've had great things, we've had bad things. In the future, who do we want to be? The same was occurring to Jesus' country and culture. The way things were was that Rome was in charge. And for the Herodians, this was good. As long as Rome was happy, Israel was safe and secure. Rome provided your guardians, so nobody would take over your country. Rome provided your uh, running water. Rome provided your safe streets. Rome provided the walls around your cities. Rome even paid for expanding parts of the temple so that more people could be there at one time. There's peace from Rome as long as you kept peace with Rome. Now the Pharisees knew the status quo ought to be that the people worshiped God, not the emperor. And at times, whoever was the emperor in Rome would demand worship. The Pharisees felt that all of these Romans coming in were bringing different faiths and diluting the Jewish faith. People were beginning to accept new gods and new foods and new habits that literally were not kosher. They wanted to wrestle the soul of the country back to God. So both of these groups were invested in their past and their future and they had different ideas of how they should go forward. So they were pretty much political opposites. Jesus comes in and he is threatening to both of them because he is complicating the story of Israel and the future of Israel. He was threatening the identity of the Herodians by appearing to be seditious and say, go against the government. He was threatening the identity of the Pharisees by doing things such as saying it's okay to heal on the Sabbath. It's better to reduce, reduce harm no matter what day of the week instead of waiting for particular days. He was threatening the status quo. So they come to Jesus and they give him a lose-lose situation. They ask him, ought we pay, should we pay the tax to Rome? Now the Herodians want this because if you pay your tax with Rome, Rome keeps you safe. The Pharisees do not want this because in paying the tax to Rome, Rome continues to be in charge and continues to uh, bring in outside people, outside influences. But if Jesus says, yes, pay the tax, then the Pharisees are going to be upset and most of Jesus' followers because they don't like Rome. If he says, no, don't pay the tax, then the Herodians can arrest him on the spot because he's advocating rebel against Rome. He is trapped if he keeps to the status quo, if he believes his only answers are pro-Rome or anti-Rome. But Jesus is all about changing perspective, about taking our old cherished stories and making them new and lively again. For us, it would be like us coming to Jesus today and asking him, do you support the president? If he says yes, he's going to make half the country angry. If he says no, he's gonna make the other half of the country angry. No matter what he says, there's going to be chaos. It was a trap question. So I think today, 
just as Jesus did back then. He would refuse to answer yes or no. He would refuse to say the world is as simple as black and white, left and right, two-dimensional. He would say that life is nuanced. He would refocus our question. It isn't a question today about whether our past was good or bad. That's too simplistic. Our past is complicated, and our future will be complicated. We love simple answers that we could put on bumper stickers and slogans, but faith is much more complicated than that. Situations and people are varied, conditional. So in the past, Jesus took the coin and he asked, who is this? Caesar. And he says, well, give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. To live in Israel was to be under Caesar. To participate in economy, to buy anything, was to participate with the economy Caesar built. So yeah, Herodians, you guys win. Pay the tax. But also... Give to God what belongs to God. So, Pharisees win. How can both sides win simultaneously? What Jesus is saying here is that we are stamped with God's image, much as the coin is stamped with Caesar's image. To exist is to exist because God has provided for us. Divine providence. We live because God gives us life. In the words of Reverend Dr. Bruce Epperly, Caesar's power can dominate our lives, but it's only temporary. Caesar's power is limited. God's power is the larger world. Yes, respect Caesar's power. Respect him in the political and governmental fields. But all political leaders whether in the past or now, are temporary. God is eternal. I think when I hear these words here, it's a reminder that saying any denomination of church, any political party, anyone, any individual, doesn't have it all together. We are all wonderfully complex messes that God loves and is pulling us together. It's hubris. Hubris is excessive pride or too much self-confidence when we declare that anyone, any institution, any country, any person is all pro-God or all anti-God. We are complicated souls. And when we get together, we are even more complicated. Dr. Epley continues, God is more than our church and our government. Caesar has a kingdom, but God has the only kingdom that expands all the universe. Jesus is not saying that this is an either or, a human kingdom versus God kingdom. Instead, that all political leaders, all political systems, all countries are finite, even the very best of them. Instead, we are to hope that our national loyalties mirror President Lincoln's comment that we need to pray that we walk on God's side rather than God joins our side. For God blesses every nation and not just our own. When I hear Lincoln's comment, I think about it, and I think about our individual and our collective past. And there are definitely times that we walked on God's side, walked alongside God. And there are definitely times that we said, God, hurry up and join me over here. Because we do that. We're human. Every person has a past full of grace and full of places where they need grace. Every nation does too. And when we come to this time, it's okay to feel all of those 
pent up anxiety emotions as we try to determine who we have been and who we want to be. It's okay. Sit in that anxiety for a moment. We're teenagers again. We're looking at a bright, beautiful future and we get to decide what we'd like to write there. I just ask that you remember President Lincoln's words and that you walk into it looking to walk alongside God instead of demanding God follow you. Because our coinage, our Caesar, is passing. All things are passing but God. And God has stamped on every single soul God's own image, saying, you are mine. And that is what pulls us together across time, across space, across political divides. In the end of the day, we all belong to God. And that thread cannot be severed, cannot be cut. You are brothers and sisters. Amen. To join me in our closing hymn. loves you. Peace. We're politically fraught, but politics can never take your identity of being a beloved child of God away. Peace. We may be in chaos, but the peace of God sticks with you and reassures you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. So go with peace and greet others with that peace. Amen. Thank you.